We will now start our first panel session titled ASEAN COVID-19, The Road to Recovery, moderated by Kavi Chongkitavorn, IRIA's <clears throat> excuse me, Senior Communication Advisor, who is also the founding father of this event. Kavi, over to you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Lydia. Good morning, everyone. So it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this uh, session. It's very important because we are talking about the road to recovery. And we are so fortunate to have uh, uh, what I would like to call three musketeers. They are so good with each other. And uh, they will discuss the different aspects of uh, the efforts uh, of the country in the region, how each COVID, the uh, internal and external uh, uh, environment to combat the uh, COVID-19. I will not uh, go into details there, CV, but we will flash uh, our speaker. The first is uh, uh, Jayan Menon. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Dr. Danny Najoko of Iria. And the third one will be uh, uh, Professor Karida from uh, TDRI from, from Bangkok. Uh, without further delay, uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, Jayan. Jayan, you have the floor. You have about uh, seven to 10 minutes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kavi. Let me start by thanking uh, Iria and Scoop for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I have a presentation which I will just try and share right now. And um, so please let me know if you cannot see it. Um, hopefully everything is in order. Um, let's try and maximize this. Okay. Uh, yeah, as I said, if anything goes wrong, please alert me. Uh, but if not, I'll assume everything is in order. So uh, I want to cover a few things in the short time that I have and go through many of these things quite quickly. The first is why the link between the pandemic and the economy is now weakening. Uh, then I want to look at how we should start thinking about the pandemic slightly differently in terms of how we measure it, as well as uh, the impacts that it's having. Uh, then I want to talk about um, how Delta uh, should hasten rather than slow border openings in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, but then uh, it has to overcome the rise in anti-globalization forces. Right, so uh, as we all know, um, the pandemic when it started was mostly in Europe and North America, but um, it is very much here and now in Asia and particularly Southeast Asia. You can see the mortality rates from the start till now has started peaking sharply recently. And this is the reality um, that we have to deal with. We were all quite happy to say goodbye to 2020, thinking that things were turning around. But unfortunately, the new variants, especially Delta, has really uh, changed things for the worse. Right, so the first point I want to make is how this link between the pandemic and the economy is weakening. I think there are three key reasons for this. The first is that unlike the original outbreak uh, early last year, the response from governments this time around has been a lot less draconian or much more targeted. We haven't seen um, the sort of general lockdowns uh, for prolonged periods that we saw uh, first time around when we want to show how to deal with this pandemic, except for Malaysia. Malaysia had a general lockdown um, for the third time uh, when this pandemic broke up because of its severity. Uh, but again, um, we didn't see the same impact because I think firms were better able to adapt to lockdown. So there was some learning by doing over time. If you look at the Google mobility data, uh, you find that um, you know, in retail, for instance, in Malaysia, uh, activity fell by 50% this time uh, compared to 80% the first time around. Right. And finally, of course, stimulus has not only continued, 
but increased. In fact, it's doubled in most countries over the last six months. So all of these things uh, suggest that Delta uh, will dampen, but not derail, economic recovery. And you can see that here in this chart, where um, you know the green bars, um, uh, which is the second quarter year-on-year -year numbers, are very much uh, bounce up in all countries uh, in the region. Right. So the uh, bottom that we hit in the second quarter of 2020 will not be retested. Uh, Kavi, I think uh, you need to mute because we can hear you typing or someone's typing. Right. So um, now I want to move on to how I think we need to redefine the pandemic as well as its impacts. I think the pandemic uh, measured by the number of infections and the impacts on the economy measured by the changes in GDP are both quickly losing relevance. Um, as vaccination rates in this region uh, try and catch up, uh, the number of hospitalizations rather than the number of infections should be the focus. So we should move from flattening the infection curve to expanding the hospital capacity curve, especially the ICU capacity curve. And we are beginning to see some of this. In Singapore, where I am, uh, the uh, numbers that the Ministry of Health reports starts with uh, the deaths, then ICU uh, numbers, then hospitalization numbers, and finally, infection rates. So the order has reversed. Uh, we still are not ready to stop reporting infection rates. Uh, when we do, I guess that's when the pandemic is officially over, but we are working our way slowly towards that. Uh, that's when pandemic becomes endemic. Um, so that's the uh, uh, infection story. So just the final point is that, uh, you know, we need to move away from infection rates because increasingly the differences in ASEAN and elsewhere has as much to do with uh, the amount and ways of testing as it, uh, and reporting as it does anything else. So. Uh, you know, these, all these factors suggest that uh, we should focus on the uh, real impacts, uh, uh, deaths and hospitalizations rather than pure infections, especially as vaccinations ramp up. Uh, and so uh, on the impact side, we also need to shift from short-term fluctuations in growth rates to long-term economic scarring. Uh, here, uh, I'm talking about uh, stubborn rises in unemployment, poverty, and all kinds of inequalities, um, as well as the intangibles, which is the rise in protectionism. And I'll return to that uh, shortly. But for now, uh, to ensure that recovery is uh, uh, sustainable, we have to start thinking about opening borders. We started uh, a while ago, um, uh, but it was stalled by the new variants. Um, and we responded by, with selective travel bans, uh, but it did not work anywhere uh, in this region or even in Australia and New Zealand, which almost completely shut their borders. Um, so uh, this is not a, this is not a way to keep them out. They will find a way in as they have. And once they do, the value of border closures starts to fall sharply. So border closures are only useful as a health protection device while they keep the variants out. Uh, Delta, I think, should hasten rather than slow border openings since it's everywhere in the region now. Um, so with um, borders mostly closed, and you can see that in this chart, these are the restrictions on borders, um, you know, uh, excessive domestic easing has been pursued uh, because of the eco economic imperative, right? And this is what has led to soaring infection rates, not border uh, openings. Um, and I think that's where we need to narrow or rebalance 
domestic versus border restrictions um, in a careful way uh, going forward. Uh, we have started now uh, in Thailand, for instance, looking at micro herd immunity, where there's been unilateral opening in Phuket and Koh Samui, and now spreading to Bali and Vietnam. Uh, this is one way to get things rolling in a unilateral way. And hopefully this will lead to uh, reciprocity, right? So this is where travel bubbles, which we tried before, uh, but failed. Hopefully they will come back. And once we get moving, then we can look at multilateralizing them uh, to include more countries, right? But uh, we have to overcome the rise in uh, anti-globalization forces that's working against these moves, right? The rise in nationalism and protectionism. Uh, and now protection comes in different <laughs> sizes. Uh, in the post-GFC period, it was called rebalancing. Uh, just before COVID, there was a lot of talk about reshoring. And now even resilience is often used as a new way to bring in protection uh, or to try and move China out of uh, global supply chains. And I think Donnie will talk a bit more about that later. So uh, while the pandemic is increasing the need for greater capital and labor mobility, it is also uh, simultaneously reducing the appetite for it, uh, which is a concern. And so I fear that what might happen is that the need will spill over into informal flows uh, if we keep formal flows uh, you know, compressed. And we've seen this before. Uh, you know, there's a lot of informal or unre unrecorded labor movements in this region. And this is not good for sending or receiving countries. And I think the pandemic has highlighted uh, that fact. So if we cannot increase factor movements, then trade uh, can partly substitute for it uh, through factor price equalizations. In other words, wages and uh, rentals on capital can equalize simply through trade, even without any movement across borders in labor or capital. And so this is where our trade agreements, uh, both regional and multilateral, like AEC, RCEP, and CPTPP, but also the WTO, which has the ministerial coming up next month, must play a bigger role going forward. So uh, with that, let me quickly conclude uh, with the key points, and that is that recovery is underway, but it's mixed and uncertain. Um, as vaccination rates rise, we need to shift the focus from infection rates to hospitalization rates. So we need to redefine uh, the pandemic in this way. Uh, Delta is uh, rapidly eroding the value, but not the costs of border closures. So it's, start to, it's time to start planning to open borders uh, as vaccination rates uh, ramp up. And we can start unilaterally with these micro herd immunity uh, bubbles and move uh, quickly to bilateral or reciprocal arrangements, and then finally to multilateralize them when we harmonize uh, standards and uh, mutually recognize them. And ASEAN here uh, can play a role, as can other regional organizations. Uh, but we must uh, first overcome the rise in anti-globalization forces that has found new fodder, fodder with this pandemic. Uh, and that will be a key challenge in the post-pandemic new normal. Uh, and if we can't overcome the uh, resistance to uh, factor movements, then we must at least try and keep trade moving, uh, trade in uh, goods and services and data, uh, because they can have similar, although they're not perfect substitutes, they can have similar impacts in reducing the adjustment costs to new normal. So with that, uh, let me stop there. Thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Back to you, Kavi. Wow, thank you very much, Jayan. As a journalist, I can see 12 headlines. But one of the biggest headlines for newspaper is one takeaway that you said the damp, uh, 
the Delta or whatever that uh, dilemma we are facing uh, will just dampen the economic growth, but it will not derail. And you leave a lot of rooms for interpretations and also I think journalists will follow up on whatever you have said in your uh, summary, very good one. Um, I'd like to proceed to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Donny from Iria. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Gavi. Let me now uh, share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so <clears throat> I have uh, seven minutes or so. Uh, basically, what I want to uh, talk here, what uh, the points I want to uh, explains, uh, complement, and uh, maybe a bit uh, uh, deepen the uh, points that Jay uh, has made. So <clears throat> I'll talk a couple of points here. Uh, there are some facts, and because of these facts, then there, real, there, there are some implications uh, for the futures. Uh, the first is <clears throat> uh, the first is. <laughs> global value chains uh, or international production networks that involve a lot of ASEAN member states, uh, we are talking about ASEAN here, uh, more or less will stay. And this is quite a robust result. Uh, and we in Hiria here uh, had uh, several papers uh, that shows this, uh, that global value chains uh, actually quickly recovered. And uh, it's it's, it was already recovered by the, the last quarter of last year. And this is consistent with one of the uh, graphs that uh, Jay show uh, in terms of GDP of uh, ASEAN member states that most of them recovered already in uh, quarter four, 2020. However, there is some uh, footnote here. Uh, while in terms of value added, uh, mostly recovered in the last quarter, but in, in, in few countries, we are seeing uh, the pattern of employment uh, already, although they are recovered, but the recovery rate uh, for employment is, is, much, is, is slower than the recovery rate in value added, which may suggest that uh, firms uh, already have started to make some adjustment in their uh, technology uh, of productions. And many people ask why global value chains uh, quickly recovered uh, in this uh, pandemic. Well, one important reason is because, uh, and we often take this for granted sometimes, uh, these networks of productions that runs across ASEAN member states uh, with the East Asian countries like Japan, Korea, and others, uh, is already very established. Uh, investment has huge investment uh, has been made by multinationals since early 1990s or even late uh, 1980s uh, on establishing these networks. And, and therefore, it's not that easy actually to break down uh, this network. So the networks is still there. Uh, however, <clears throat> because the extent of the shock this time is, was extraordinary, then adjustment, of course, need to be made. And we are start seeing this. The point in regard to this adjustment, uh, basically there is a lot of pressure for efficiency for the companies, for the multinational, the subcontractors, because at least two reasons. First, it's, now we are seeing a much more limited movement of, of people across countries. So in terms of global value chains, this really limit the movement of uh, professionals, of, for example, engineers, technicians, uh, supervisors of uh, uh, factories. And, and we in Iria uh, noted that this happened quite a lot uh, in mid uh, last year when uh, new investment in some of the CLMV countries cannot be uh, really you know, materialized because of this movement, limited movement of people. And because there is limited movement of people and because there is a lot of uh, goods uh, or inputs are carried by uh, airplanes. Uh, there's also, there, there is, a, you know, much uh, lower uh, traffics uh, of in air transport as well as in sea transport. There is, also, for example, the lack of uh, supply of containers in many countries uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, the, the implication is the logistics uh, costs 
faced by firms increase and to some of them what i heard it could be significant like three to five times um, compared to the before pandemic so companies have to cope with this uh, the global value change there the uh, companies needs to be uh, really made adjustment for this and the the adjustment or the direction of the adjustment uh, can be in these three following uh, uh, area. First is, of course, adopting more uh, digital technology. I guess even before the pandemic, uh, companies around the world have started to adopt more uh, digitalized uh, technology, but the pandemic has just accelerated uh, this uh, uh, adoption, or adoption of the uh, digital. And this actually, not does not happen only in private sectors this needs to happen also in public sectors and if we, if we are talking about the uh, global uh, value chains uh, countries need to make a lot of investment uh, to upgrade their <coughs> uh, their digitalizations for example for for trade facilitations like in facilities in seaports airports uh, for <coughs> customs uh, for all of the uh, elements of trade facilitation, for national single windows, for example. Uh, so a lot of elements of trade facilitation needs to be uh, much more digitalized. <clears throat> uh, second, of course, is streamlining, streamlining this, the supply process uh, across and within the value chains. And, and I guess uh, much part of this is uh, has something to do with uh, technology up upgrading and and i guess a uh, few or several surveys done by uh, many institutions including us have shown this that uh, ceos uh, uh, all ceos <coughs> uh, have an option to uh, uh, actually invest upgrading their technology during the pandemic uh, period and because companies are upgrading more in high tech uh, of course, the, another implication is there, need, there is a need to upgrade the human capital uh, to transform uh, the, the skill because there will be a lot more high technology uh, uh, productions uh, machineries installed in manufacturers. Now, that's kind of one uh, line of story. The second is I want to touch the point about uh, RCEPs. Uh, regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Jay mentioned that this uh, should facilitate uh, the recovery, <clears throat> the path of recovery post-pandemic. And from, from uh, my point of view, or some, uh, some of us actually, uh, the, 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 at the end, it will, uh, uh, implementation of RCP will be needed even more uh, in order to uh, facilitate the recovery during the post-pandemic. Now, RCEP itself is a, what's so called pre-pandemic uh, FTA. Uh, it was uh, designed, negotiated, and signed before the, the pandemic. But because the RCEP is intended uh, to making trade between countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia a lot cheaper, and this is to facilitate a deeper and expanded global value chains. For example, we can see that uh, you know one of these uh, feature of RCEP is uh, a lot more uh, relaxed rule of origin for trade in intermediate inputs. For example, that's really making trade between countries a lot cheaper, and that means uh, supporting for higher growth in global value chains. So at the end, uh, <clears throat> what is intended uh, to be achieved by RCEP? is in accordance to what is needed by, by the economy or private sectors in general during the post-pandemic because of there is this pressure for uh, efficiency. So the implication is, as I noted, uh, the, focus to, the focus on reforms uh, that needed to, to implement RCEP uh, is becoming much more needed this time. I guess I will stop there, Kavi, uh, back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, you have uh, discussed uh, in a very good details of the adjustments that uh, all the countries in the region have to make, both internally and externally. Luckily, as you 
mentions the global value chains in the region recover uh, pretty fast. And I think this will explain uh, a speedier uh, recovery uh, within the region facilitated by uh, our super free trade pact, which need further reform. Thank you so much for uh, bringing out these uh, this Syrian points. Now, our last speaker is our rather well-known economist from Thailand, Dr. Grida. You have the floor, please. Thank you so much, Kun Gowi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are. I'm based in Bangkok, and um, it's such a pleasure to be here today to be able to share with you um, how we see, you know, the um, the post-pandemic um, recovery um, happening. And, and as uh, I was discussing with Kun Gowi, that Jay and Donnie has, you know, um, you know, lots of interesting points and very relevant information to share already. So what I would probably um, contribute today is how we see some mega trends going forward that will affect ASEAN and also probably some of the opportunities for ASEAN in order to grow you know, into the future in the post-pandemic world. So you know, I would like to um, you know, take about seven to ten minutes to, um, to highlight these uh, you know, issues so that journalists in the region can keep an eye out for them um, in the future. And I, I would like to say that I would like to um, divide the trends that I see into two parts. Um, first part is um, trends that uh, have to do with the macroeconomics, um, and that will definitely affect ASEAN economies as well. And then I will go to the second set of trends that are non, you know, econo um, economic, macroeconomic, but it does affect ASEAN economies. And then um, towards the end, I will point out some of the um, business opportunities that um, ASEAN countries, um, you know, could uh, could take advantage of in this post-pandemic world. So let me start, you know, by by talking about um, the, the mega trends that, that um, we see, um, starting with the macroeconomic trends. And uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind that growth um, is, is happening now, um, the world is recovering, but recovery is divergent. Right, I mean the developed countries are growing much faster um, in um, this uh, post-pandemic um, period, while the developing countries are growing, um, but it's still much slower because it's still grappling with the pandemic issues um, as we speak. So you know, and we're in Asia in in the second group, which is the developing country group. So we're, we're, we'll recover, but it will be slower. The faster pace of um, recovery in the developed countries, especially in the US, does have implication for our economy. Um, namely that, first of all, you know, interest rates um, in, the, in, in the US will rise probably by the end of next year. So that will you know, push interest rates in the world up as well. And as we know, many countries in ASEAN um, have incurred debt, uh, especially public debt during um, the pandemic period um, to fight the, you know, the pandemic. Many governments have borrowed. So you know, as interest rates you know, um, are looking to rise in the future, this will be a challenge that we have to look out for, especially for the public um, sector uh, uh, debt uh, that, you know, of developing countries um, have, have incurred. I mean, the, the IIF um, latest data states that the, the you know, debt in um, the world is around 300 trillion US dollars at the moment. Um, and, you know, a third of them are in developing or uh, in, in emerging markets. So it, it's, it's a huge number that we have to look out for. But it's not only interest rates, right, that will be rising. Um, the U.S. dollar is also strengthening. And that's because when the U.S. economy recovers, the U.S. has, you know, reduced um, its, um, its quantitative easing. So, you know, by reducing quantitative easing, it's pumping out less um, U.S. dollars per month. And, you know, the, the forecast is that probably by the end of next year, they will stop, you know, pumping additional. U.S. dollars. So, with the decline in, in the you know, in, in the additional supply of U.S. dollars, the U.S. dollar has been strengthening. And again, this is why our regional currencies has been weakening. And if you know, if you're in debt, and especially in um, countries which have incurred uh, foreign currency debt, the rising interest rates, the strengthening U.S. dollars will definitely uh, affect them. So, so this is something that you know one has to look out for. Um, you know, in in terms of the of the post-pandemic sort of like macroeconomic uh, impact that um, 
ASEAN countries will, will need to face. Um, so, you know, that, those are the things that I think on the macroeconomic front that we need to look out for. For the non-macroeconomic um, trends that I um, see that will, will be important for ASEAN, um, definitely the US, um, China trade and um, tech wars will definitely play a big role here, um, especially, you know, for ASEAN countries that are supply chains or global value chains, you know, of, of the US and of China, because that will be changing as well as the US and China you know, wage continue to wage the trade war, which is probably not going to end anytime soon. So, so that you know, will definitely affect the supply chains. And we're already seeing relocations of firms from China to uh, Southeast Asia. And these are not only Chinese firms, these are um, American firms, Japanese firms, South Korean firms, Taiwanese firms. They are relocating or you know ch changing their 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 supply chains, um, and many of them have relocated to Southeast Asia to reduce the risk of, of you know being in China. So they were uh, diversifying. So most of the capacity that's being moved to um, Southeast Asia, for example, are um, production that you know used to be produced in China for exports. Those are moved to Southeast Asia, but the production that is produced and consumed or sold in China that's still kept in China, and we're seeing a, a lot of of, you know, relocations, for example, in Thailand, where I am now, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of car manufacturers, car part manufacturers, um, um, electronics um, manufacturers, um, electrical appliance manufacturers um, that are moving from China to, to Thailand. But for example, Vietnam, which is the largest recipient of the relocations, are receiving, you know, investments um, all you know, from a whole spectrum from like footwear to um, to tablets so it's, it's a it's a wide spectrum uh, you know of investments there in Vietnam so so we're seeing this as part of the, the, the um, response to the to the US China trade war but also um, don't forget there's also a technology war that is waging uh, um, between the two countries and that has already you know affected some of us in the region especially um, if we need um, advanced semiconductors or chips for production. For example, in Thailand, we use those for cars, um, manufacturing or production in Thailand. And the shortage of chips, um, you know, have been a big problem here because, um, you know, we have to uh, shut down um, our car production from time to time because of the shortage of chips. And these chips are being used in, you know, tablets and phones. Um, and, and this is, you know, in, in short supply at the moment. One of the reasons is because um, of the high demand, but the other is also because the supply is now being limited when the U.S. has um, now, you know, um, issued you know, sort of like a, a, a regulation or, or uh um, measures that do not allow uh, companies that use U.S. technology to supply parts um, of semiconductors to China. So Chinese semiconductors companies cannot produce semiconductors at the moment. So that's already affecting us. And in the future, of course, they you know um, will be you know um, more of these impacts um, coming um, in the future. For example, in the area of telecommunications, for example, 5G, 6G, the world will be split into two camps of technology, and, and as, as as a user of technology in ASEAN, who do we, who do we um, choose to use? Which technology? Or if we need to use both, that will be quite expensive for us. So this is also something that you know um, uh, will will be important to to keep an eye on. And you know other trends that that um, that we see um, other than the um, the the trade and the tech war between the two um, uh, giants. Uh, for example, um, of course, you know, digitalization, you know, as, as um, Adani also mentioned, that will not go away anytime soon. Um, digitalization, um, you know, uh, we can see a lot from e-commerce, for example, here in Thailand over the past one year, e-commerce um, grew by 200%, uh, of course, from a low base, but, you know, this is a, a very fast pace and it's going to continue. It's going to continue in the future because people are used to it, but it's not only e-commerce, right? I mean, it's, it's anything that's from home, um, entertainment or even telemedicine, which is going to be the, fi the future of, of you know, um, healthcare here in, in the region as well. So that's something that you know, one should keep an eye on. And of course, you know, when we talk about digitalization, we also talk about the, the supply chains um, of them. So anything to do with um, you know, digital uh, technology providers, software, so even cybersecurity uh, providers. I mean, you know, these are um, uh, businesses that are, are really doing doing well at this time, um, not to mention even the, you know, the delivery service from the e-commerce. So, so these are things that, you know, will, will, will help growth um, in, in 
um, Southeast Asia going forward. Uh, and, and this will probably you know, reduce costs for uh, many of the small and medium enterprises um, in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia as well. So that's something that, that we see you know, that will, will continue as well. Um, the two other things that I want to mention, actually three, uh, is uh, uh, for climate change. You know, that's going to be here and we will definitely you know, have to have to uh, cope with it, but uh, but with climate change, um, that has to do a lot because we you know, rely a lot on agriculture. So that you know has a, a lot to do um, you know with um, the economies of Southeast Asia as well. So that's something to 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 still you know pretty much keep an eye on. Um, but also with with climate change comes now a push for decarbonization, all right, especially in um, in the West where in the next two years, for example, the European Union has announced that they will start their border tax on, um, on goods that, you know, that, that import with um, high carbon content. So that's something that um, you know, ASEAN countries have to adapt as well because we are you know, exporters of goods to um, the European Union. It's, uh, it's, it's one of our big markets. So, so here again, you know, the decarbonization um, is, you know, we can view it at, at one point as, you know, as a challenge because um, many of the Southeast Asian countries countries haven't really prepared ourselves to um, decarbonize, uh, um, but, and, and it will have an impact on us because we'll have difficulties exporting to Europe in the future. But all at the same time, I think it's also an opportunity for many industries or businesses um, that are green, you know, that um, adopt, you know, the circular economy or adopt um, you know, the bioeconomy, you know, that will be opportunities. And especially I want to mention that in this region, um, you know, we, we have a good chance of being um, the you know, the supply chain for bioproducts, for example, because we are rich in the raw materials of agriculture and bioproducts here, I mean, anything to do, um, you know, add value to agriculture, um, you know, from cosmetics, you know, to medicine, right, to um, degradable plastics, or even to plant-based uh, proteins. So, you know, I think this is something that, you know, we, we have um, some um, comparative advantage uh, in the region uh, because of the abundant raw materials, and we need to add value um, to take advantage of the, of the bioeconomy, which is also green and also low carbon as well. So that's something that I think, you know, is a challenge, but also um, it is an opportunity. Um, the last thing I would like to mention um, is the aging society. And that's something that is, um, you know, inevitable. Uh, we know, you know, Singapore um, has aged, um, Japan has aged, China has aged, Thailand has aged. Um, many other countries in the region will be aging. So that's something that is to look out for because um, aging does not only um, affects, you know, the, the government um, spending on welfare for them, but also, you know, the labor force is falling. Um, you know, can we build synergy between countries that are aging and countries that still have a big young population. So that's something that, you know, that's very, you know, that's very challenging. But at the same time, it presents a lot of opportunities as well, because the market for, you know, for aging population is now much bigger. And, you know, to be honest, when I look at the global map on aging, it's usually the, the, the more wealthy countries who are aging first. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to produce uh, products or services um, to, um, to cater to the, to the aging population, um, especially you know, in, in our export market. So um, I know I've ran out of time and I think I've pretty much covered you know, both the, um, the trends and the risk and the opportunities that us in countries can look forward to in the post-COVID um, world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grida. You have given us a lot uh, uh, to shield on, especially the global trend. I think my two takeaway for journalists is the rivalry between US and China, trade conflict that will impact on the technological uh, development within the region. You uh, has been pretty bold in saying that, you know, maybe we have to choose size between the American or the US led technology, we will see very interesting. And I think uh, we have to get ready in the futures because of the climate change, the so-called decarbonization. I think country in our region still um, have not put that in their agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, uh, we, we will have a very good, uh, uh, questions and answer sessions. Uh, we already have questions uh, come in. Lydia, can you help me? I have seen the chat box uh, uh, questions uh, for everyone, right? Can you yeah, read that so, aloud, please? So the first question that came in was from Pa Iman Bambagil, who's asking essentially, 
Uh, how do we maximize the potential of the of digitalization and um, especially in the context of a, a, the borderless world? So I'm not sure who would like to address that. Uh, why don't uh, I, I think uh, uh, Jayan, please, can you take up the first one first? Oh, okay. I thought you were going to go to the others first, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think uh, you know, as, as um, both Donny and uh, Kirita have mentioned, the digital uh, you know uh, economy has been accelerated uh, by the pandemic. Uh, it was already starting, but it's gone a lot further. I guess this event today is a good example of that itself. Um, I think there's a, a number of issues. I think uh, it will cause a lot of disruption to uh, labor markets. Uh, and that's um, on the negative side. There are lots of positives that you can have, uh, including on increasing inclusion um, and supporting SMEs to engage in international e-commerce and so on. But uh, on the adjustment side, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, labor market churning, as it's called, uh, especially uh, in the lower end of the skills spectrum. And this is where you know, we will need a lot more uh, uh, labor mobility, both within countries as well as across borders. And my concern is that the, uh, the barriers that have been erected uh, in the name of uh, health and the pandemic to labor movements will remain in place a lot longer than they're required uh, once we move into a post-pandemic new normal. Uh, you know, the new normal is going to involve high levels of unemployment at home. And, uh, you know, there'll be resistance to open up borders to labor inflows. Um, and this might spill over into informal or unrecorded labor inflows. So I think the digital economy has a lot of positives it can provide, but we also need to understand there'll be a lot of adjustment costs and we need to keep or return uh, you know, to uh, open uh, borders, uh, to keep labor mobility going uh, when it's required uh, in a post-pandemic new normal. Let me stop there and leave it to others to say more. May I add something to, to this as well? Yes, um, please. I, I think um, as, as Jay rightly mentioned that, you know, this will be disruptive. And I can think of two other sectors that will be disrupted. I mean, there are many good things that come up from the digital economy. But as Jay mentioned, there are also disruptions that come about. Two of them that I can see is one is in the financial sector. Definitely, there will be benefits for, you know, for uh, more lending to, um, you know, to grasp roots, um, you know, communities of people, but of course, banks will be um, disrupted. Uh, and of course, if banks are, you know, the major players in any um, uh, Southeast Asian countries, I mean, their profits would drop and, you know, that might have an, an, an impact on, on the um, economy as well. So that's something to look out for as well is the financial disruption. The other thing that I see is in the property sector, you know, as more and more um, people, um, you know, work from home, there will be less, you know, um, demand, you know, for office spaces. And, and in, in Bangkok here, I see a lot of vacant um, office spaces, and that could also be quite disruptive to the, um, to the property sector. And especially Especially to those that lend money to the property sector, that's banks. So again, you know, this has um, implications for for these sectors to adapt. And if they can't, I mean, they can't. They there might be some, um, you know, um, economic impact in, in the short run um, to to the economies. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kirida. Uh, Donny, do you have anything to yeah. add to that? Yeah, if I may, Kavi. Uh, Selamat pagi, Pak Iman. Thank you. Uh, apa kabar? And well, you are the man for RCP. Of course, but uh, answering your questions, try to answer those questions. Uh, there are a few points, but in my view, <clears throat> first, uh, digital and uh, economic integrations or uh, a country's economy is, is seems like it's a test to our institutions, both at the country level and at multi regional, uh, multilateral level. So uh, it's a test because. Digitalizations and private sectors typically has moved forward a lot faster than the public sector, the government sector. Uh, for example, 
uh, I have one research uh, in the last years, and I noticed uh, there are a few creative way to do trade uh, fair and using uh, the virtual reality technology. Uh, I guess Korea uh, has uh, experimented this uh, at much earlier time last year, as well actually Indonesia, as far as I know also uh, applied this because of the move, uh, uh, limitation in the movement of people. So trade fair is done virtually and using virtual reality. That's, that's very, 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 uh, very good. But then when there is or there are new trade deals, export deals coming out from this new way of trade fair, sometimes new exporters do not know how to export. And, and therefore, uh, to facilitate that, there is a need uh, from our institutions, both at the country level or at multilateral level, uh, such as ASEAN, uh, need to be, you know, need to be, uh, I mean, the reform uh, under this, this uh, country level, need, or ASEAN level, need to be uh, speed up. And if we are talking about ASEAN level, the way I see it actually is ASEAN economic community uh, can be used as a platform to, to further speed up this reform uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, and it can be used as a platform to, to, to digitalize more. And by the way, uh, one reason why between countries transaction because of digitalization pretty much is still limited because all of these institutional factors, the way I see it. And there is the reasons why, as Krida mentions, the growth of digital related economy activities is extremely rapid within the country at the domestic level. Because basically there is no borders. SME can just anytime on board to platforms, e-commerce platform and sell without any institutional barrier. Uh, so, so the digitalization really flourished within country at this moment because there is no barrier, institutional barrier. Now back to the, the point uh, on the AEC can be used as a platform. I guess what comes next, if we want to be effective, and this is related to the question from the other uh, participants, is to focus and to strategize, and I guess to maybe to focus on details. Uh, for example, <clears throat> and and. On this, uh, we or ASEAN in general can utilize, or you know, any any countries or any groupings can utilize research, uh, and the strategy could be focusing on some details of the aspect of uh, trade reform or investment reform. For example, on services, uh, reforms could be focused or prioritized in sectors that really important for global value chains, such as logistics business services, uh, or even uh, uh, digital services. Uh, for micro and small enterprises, for example, reform can be focused. Uh, this is, for example, if you are talking about the SME group of ASEAN, AXMI, uh, reform can be focused on capacity building because uh, for SMEs to, to get into, a, to get onto platforms, there is some skill, uh, there is some sort of need of uh, specific skill, digital skills that still need, need to be nurtured for many of the micro and small enterprises. So I guess the, the, the key word is focus and strategize and go into details. Yeah, maybe there's something that I can add, uh, Pak Gavi, thank you. Oh, well, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, that explains why uh, Donny from Indonesia can uh, uh, exemplify Indonesia uh, using digitalization SME, you know, you have so many unicorn now. <laughs> okay, we have times for for one more question. Lydia, you have uh, extra questions? Um, let's see. Sorry. I saw one. There are several. So there was one uh, follow-up for Donnie on RCEP, and then there was another one for Giant on will COVID variants upset the benefits? Will, will any new possible COVID variants upset the benefits of opening borders? So just very quickly, because actually this panel's out of time. We need to move to the next okay. panel. Okay. 
Okay, b b before we, uh, we answer this, I, I would like to uh, request uh, the panelists to give their answer and also wrap up what they want to say. One minute each, please, because the time is up. Thank you. Can we start with uh, uh, Dr. Girida, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I just want to say that, um, you know, there will be uh, many um, uncertainties that we're still uh, looking forward to, um, especially on, you know, the variant of the, of the virus. Um, and again, you know, we have to look out for, you know, a few things um, regarding the U.S.-China relations, as well as uh, the um, issues on the climate change and environment as well. So um, it's going to be a bumpy ride going forward, though we can see recovery in the horizon. So again, you know, um, it will be quite interesting um, to, to keep an eye out for all these uh, important issues that all of our three panelists have highlighted today. I think that will be all I would like to say because we're running out of time now. Thank you so okay. much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a good message. Uh, Dr. Jayan, your turn. Right. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me try and answer the question, I guess, that was posed about whether we need to be concerned uh, about new variants uh, and so uh, whether we should still keep borders closed. Well, if border closures could keep out new variants, then we should. But um, all the evidence has suggested that uh, it cannot. And the reason for that is because by the time the genetic sequencing alone doesn't tell us whether it's a much more transmissible variant. It has to show up in large case numbers. And by, by the time that it shows up in large case numbers, it's too late. The horse has bolted, so to speak. So uh, I would support border closures if they could work, but they can't. And so, um, you know, I think um, uh, the other point is that, um, uh, you know, we've actually exacerbated the problem because we've relied only on domestic easing to support the economy and the economy uh, health trade-off. And in fact, that's been counterproductive. If we could balance it a bit more with, uh, border and domestic uh, restrictions, I think we could get the same economic impact with less health, uh, negative health consequences. And uh, that's where I think we should go forward in a recalibration that evens up the balance of domestic and border restrictions to serve both our economic and health objectives. Let me stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chan. How about Donnie? You have fifty seconds. Okay, just, just want up. to yeah, just want to maybe wrap up in answering the the questions on RCP. Uh, effective action or strategies? Uh, I guess uh, if if we are thinking RCP is meant for strengthening global value chains in ASEAN and East Asia, that means what we can do is to focus on elements of global value chains uh, under RCP. So, for example, if you're talking about services uh, reform or liberalization under RCP, then we can focus on you know, sectors like business services, logistics, or even digital. And if we are talking about uh, uh, yeah, uh, rule of origins or NTMs, NTMs, for example, we can focus on uh, NTMs for the groups of intermediate inputs or services. Uh, services is for under services. Now, uh, you're also asking about the uh, stakeholders. I guess uh, the, the usual stakeholders, of course, but much more importantly, I guess private sectors uh, needs to be really uh, considered uh, in the process of uh, monitoring and evaluation of RCEP because uh, they are the, you know, the, the most important client of this RCEP uh, agreement. And maybe I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Kavi. Yeah. Oh, wow, thank you very much. Uh... After listening to all of you, my bottom line is the pandemic has created tons of crisis and also opportunity for innovations and also bringing together uh, to, uh, people, policy planners, all stakeholders. And we look forward to a better post-pandemic world. I would like to thank all the panelists for their very rich analysis. And also I think journalists uh, will have a lot to report on. Thank you so much for your uh, um, thank excellent you. Thank insight. you, Gavi. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, panelists. Yeah.